I hope you have time this Father's Day to celebrate your dad or remember your dad, spend time with your dad or the dads around you. If you are a dad, I hope you're celebrated well today. I know my daughter's still trying to figure all of those kinds of things out. It was putting her to bed last night. She's six and she said, Dad, I'm so excited tomorrow's your birthday. It's not my birthday. It's just Father's Day. We just celebrate all dads. Just, oh, okay. Does that, does that mean you're going to dress up really fancy? Well, I'm going to probably go to church the same way I'm dressed every kind of Sunday. Oh, I was really hoping you'd wear a bow tie. I don't even own a bow tie. I own plenty of ties, but I don't even own a bow tie. So my daughter's likely to have her Father's Day start off with disappointment as she sees me and the fact that I have no bow tie on today. Well, I hope that you get to celebrate with your family as well. Uh, I'm excited this morning to continue in our series talking about the heart of our staff. It began a few weeks ago as Pastor Bruce shared his heart on how we would relate as it comes to disputable matters. And then a couple of weeks ago as Pastor Nathan shared his heart on how we would be other-oriented and engage with others. Last week I talked about the heart of our denomination and what my bosses would say about our denomination. And so I uh, would pray that that would happen as well. I'm getting heads up from people in the back that the ushers never came and took the offering. Um, and so I'm going to invite them forward. We're going to take the offering um, at this time. So the ushers, you can just come down. I prayed for it a while ago, if you didn't remember that. Um, prayed for it. Um, so we'll pray that God uses it well, that it blesses his kingdom and to the ends of the earth as well. So the ushers can come and distribute those baskets now. Today, I get to continue that series, talking about my heart. And then next week, it'll follow up. Pastor Rob will share his, followed by Sherry Morgan, our children's director, who in two weeks will share her heart. But um, if you were standing in my shoes, you may, uh, or pictured yourself here, you may understand that there can be a set of nerves as it comes to sharing your heart. That there's a vulnerability that comes alongside opening up what's deep within you and maybe personal to you with a group of people who haven't necessarily thought or prayed or felt the same kinds of things. And so I'm going to do that this morning, but ask in the midst of that uh, that you would extend me some grace. There may be some things that don't come out quite as clearly as I hope they will, um, and that you would extend grace as I just open up some of my heart for this church and for you this morning. I want to begin just by simply saying this, I love this church, and I love serving it. It is a privilege and honor to have the position that I do. I don't take it lightly. It is deeply meaningful to me. Whenever I'm asked by people, whether it's people that uh, I know from other spheres of life or from churches I've worked in before, when I meet with other pastors, a common question is asked. People will just look at me and they'll say, how are things at now then? Or how are things at your church? That's the question I'll get often. And so today you get some insight into how I always answer that question. I generally start by answering a different question. What I often think they're asking, I always say, my family and I are treated really well here. I often assume that when they ask that question, some of what they want to know is, how am I doing at the church? Says, my family and I are treated really well. And then I move on to the actual answer to that question and the more important answer to the question. And God is at work. God's at work at my life personally. He's in work in the lives of many of the people who attend personally. He's in work in us collectively as a local church. He's at work in the community around us. I am treated, and my, me and my family are treated well here, and God is at work. I kind of close my generic answer to that, state, that question then with a, a joking kind of statement. I say, and on top of that, most of the people like me. I know because of the kind of role I have and the kinds of decisions that I'm then tasked with making, the kinds of leadership responsibilities that fall onto my plate, I'm under no illusion that at all times will everybody like the kinds of ways that I lead or the answers I come up with or the solutions or the way I lead us towards God. But by and large, most of the people do. The concluding joke that ends, I'm convinced my approval rating is higher than any president in our history. My family and I are treated well here. God is at work. Most of the people like me. And I'm convinced my approval rating is higher than any president in our history. The truth of the matter, beyond that, 
is that my installation here as the lead pastor wasn't simply a job I took. It wasn't simply an offer I accepted. It was a covenant with God that I entered to see a community worship him well together and to then proclaim him to a world in desperate need of him. And that collectively we as a church would be in intimate union with Christ as his bride. The covenant I entered with God, and it's the hope that I would long to be true of us, that we would worship God together, that we would proclaim him to a community that's in need, and we would be as intimately focused on being the bride of Christ as we can be. And yet, this morning, as I share my heart, you'll hear some of it that will come across as picture of that, and some of it will come across as challenge or conviction that we aren't fully there yet. Because what often happens in our individual lives, and our collective lives, is that we give our life over to something that isn't just Christ. We add other things, good things, no doubt, but we add other things into our life, and then we wonder why we've clouded our lives with lots of things that our intimacy with Christ isn't where we want it to be. That as we're his bride, and yet maybe not experiencing the fullness of Christ in the way we would hope to, and we question why that is, I think the answer is often because we haven't given ourselves fully to Christ. We've added other things into the midst of that. I want to talk about that through three different texts in the book of Matthew. The first of those is in Matthew chapter 4, if you want to follow along. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 18, it says this, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. It's a picture of some fishermen casting a net into the lake on the Sea of Galilee. This is what it would have looked like as Jesus approached, except there likely were more boats and more fishermen doing the same kinds of things. And as Jesus is there, he takes notice of Simon and Andrew, and he approaches their boat and says to them in Matthew 19, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people, or your translations may say, and I will make you fishers of men. It's their response that I want to highlight in verse 20. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Their livelihood, their jobs, all that they knew and the way they spent all of their days. Immediately at the call of Jesus to be in relationship with him, they left it. They let go of it. They said goodbye to it. It continues the next verse. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Happy Father's Day, Dad. We're off. (laughs) This time not just says that they left their nets, but they left the boat and family members that were in the boat with them. Immediately. They left. We don't yet know if this was celebrated by dad because they were being recruited by a rabbi to join the profession that they had always hoped for, or if this was grieved by dad that his sons would so quickly leave because scripture doesn't say anything more about Zebedee ever. It does say something about his wife, their mom. She shows up a bunch of chapters later. She approaches, comes running to Jesus, says, Jesus, I need you to promise me something. Would you guarantee me? My sons sit at your right hand in the kingdom. Because they've left. And if they've left, it better have been because they're going to do well and be celebrated and it's going to all work out. Would you guarantee me that they're going to sit at your right hand? Immediately, they left everything. In a simple statement, I want to clarify what I think took place for the disciples and what I think needs to take place for most of us. And that's that when a call to follow Jesus comes, it has to take precedence, even and maybe especially when it means leaving some good things behind. I want to say that again. That when a call to follow Jesus comes, it has to take precedence, even and maybe especially when it means we have to leave some good things behind. The disciples left boats and nets and family to follow Jesus. 
Many of us have maybe seen some of that play out in our own lives. In pursuit of what Jesus has done in our lives or the way he's called us, we've had to leave locations we've lived before. We just commissioned 60 new workers into the field as a denomination. That's 60 people who have to leave what they've known, leave good things behind to go do what God has called them to do. Because of that, I've seen as people have followed Jesus, it's meant they've had to leave relationships behind. Some of my best friends have had to move across the country because of the call of God in their life to go do other things. Maybe we have to leave jobs. Maybe we have to leave hobbies. Maybe we have to leave family members. Good things. But when a call to follow Jesus comes, it always has to take precedence. Even and maybe especially when that means we have to leave some good things behind. We've seen this and we've got become comfortable with this in other areas of our lives. Not always necessarily when we're, when we're the bride of Christ, but we recognize it in marriages. That often when two become one, when husband and wife become one, that means people have had to leave some things to make that happen. That was true in my own life. As Jenny and I were engaged and as our marriage date was getting closer, Jenny recognized that she would have to leave the church she had known her whole life. 24 years spent worshiping under the same pastor with the same group of people with the same kinds of ways she had come accustomed to talking about experiencing and expressing her love for God and yet she was marrying somebody who was a pastor and working for a church that was doubtful that I was going to stop attending the church I worked for. And so as our two lives would become one and as we would do spirituality joint together, it meant she had to say goodbye to a good thing in her life to come join me at a different church. And there was grieving involved in that, and that's okay. I imagine there were days where the disciples missed being on the boat and casting the net, spending time with dad, doing what they had done every day for a long time. It's okay to grieve that loss. And yet it still had to happen. Maybe the question that comes to us is, what good things might Jesus ask us to be leaving behind? The truth of the matter is I think it's really hard for us to do that. In the culture we live in, in the society most of us have been raised in, we are told to find good things, grasp them tightly, try to get more and hoard more of them and get as many good things involved in our life as possible. And I'm not, I'm not against that. We're allowed to and God blesses us with good things and holding them is fine. And yet... For so many of us then, when God calls us to something different, something new, something deeper than what we've had before, we always look at him holding these things and saying, only if I can bring them with me. Because I've firmly put this good thing in my hand, either in front of Jesus or at least alongside him. And we say, God, here's what I really want faith to look like. I'm going to grab all the good things life has to offer. You haven't condemned any of them, and they're not sin. They're allowable. They're pleasurable. They're fine. They're maybe even noble. And I've got them in my life, and I, I'd love for you to just add yourself into that and bless those things. Come alongside the good that's in my life. And yet I think often the call of Jesus is to say, no, you have to let go of some of those good things to come into the new things that I'm calling you to. To have full intimacy with Christ as our bride, we can't be holding anything alongside or in front of Jesus. We have to let go of them. And frankly, our society, us as individuals, we're not good at that. We grasp tightly to the good things of our life. Second story comes in Matthew chapter 19. A man comes to Jesus. It's a story often called the rich young ruler. It says this in verse 16. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? I'll, I'll get to the other verse on the screen here in just a moment. But, but I want to just remind us that this man is coming to Jesus, acknowledging him as a teacher, acknowledging him as a rabbi, acknowledging that he may have insight into how the kingdom of God works well. And this man shows up essentially saying, I don't have everything I want with my faith yet. I don't feel in perfect communion with God. I don't have confidence that I have eternal life with him. What do I still have to do? 
unhappy with either who he is or where he is in his faith. And he asks Jesus about that, and Jesus responds, Why are you calling me good? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And the man responds, Well, which ones do I have to keep? He inquired, and Jesus replies, Well, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he responds, All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Many of us can find ourselves in the same place. We may have obeyed God well. We may have learned his commands, listened to them, practiced them as best as we know how, and yet there's some part of us that still cries out, God, I don't feel as intimate with you as I want to. I don't feel as confident in my relationship with you as I want to. The obedience of your commands hasn't given me everything you offer and that I desire from you. What, what do I still lack? What is it that I'm missing? No different than for the rich young ruler, the same is true in our lives. We will not obey our way into right relationship with God. We will not get the fullness of intimacy with God. We will not appropriately reflect the bride of Christ if all we're cared about is following his command. We have to abide with God. And so as the man asks, what do I still lack? Here's how Jesus answers. If you want to be perfect... Go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. And verse 22 shows his response. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. What Jesus says to the man is, if you want the full intimacy, the full confidence of eternal life, if you want to be the bride of Christ the way you're supposed to, follow Jesus as well as you can. Here's what has to happen. That really good thing in your life that you're holding tightly to, you need to let go of it. Not because it's bad. Jesus doesn't ever try to convince anybody that money is evil or that fishing nets were evil or that boats or that fathers are evil. They're good things. But if we have held them either alongside or in front of Christ, they're a stumbling block to doing what we're supposed to do and having the relationship and intimacy with him we're supposed to have. And so Jesus says that that good thing in your life that you've hitched yourself to, unhitch yourself from that and then follow me. And the man leaves sad, holding instead to the good thing in his life. He had tried to add Jesus to it, and Jesus says that's not the way it works. It's not just a story of how the disciples follow him or the rich young ruler that approaches him. This is how Jesus teaches consistently. It's why we read verses in other parts of Matthew that say things like, if you don't hate your brother or your mother or your father, or in Luke chapter 9, when some come to Jesus and say, we want to follow you, but first we're going to go back and bury our father. We're going to go back and kind of walk through end of life things with him. That might take a little while, but then after that we'll come. Or another says, uh, first uh, I want to follow you, but first let me, let me go back and kind of shore up the family business thing and say goodbye to everybody and put nice bows on all the good stuff I have. Jesus' response to them when they say that. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and then looks back is unfit for service in the kingdom of God. Anyone who grasps too tightly to the good thing, even the noble thing, even the religious, right, family-oriented kind of thing, but grasps to that and says, no, I need to explore that, celebrate that, tie that up, I need to prioritize that first, and then I'll get to Jesus Jesus says is unfit for service in the kingdom of God. You know what the scripture doesn't generally say? If you broke the commands, you're unfit for service in the kingdom of God. No, instead what we see is murderers used by God, liars used by God, adulterers used by God, people who didn't honor their mother and father, people who stole, people who bore false witness, all those commands he had given, plenty of people who break those God uses and shows his power through their weakness. 
But consistently, Jesus says, but if you're the kind of person who wants to consistently hold on to the things, even if they're good things, and place them alongside me or in front of me, then you are unfit for service in the kingdom of God. Many of us may like the rich young ruler show up and say to God, say to a pastor, say to our friends, our small group, our family, what would it look like to be more intimate? I don't know that we're yet experiencing all that God has to offer. And his answer is, let go of the good things you've placed alongside or in front of Jesus. They're making you unfit for service, and so you're not the bride you've longed to be. You're not intimate in the way you would hope it would be. Jesus turns to his disciples and says it would be hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And when the disciples hear this, they say they were greatly astonished and asked, well, who then can be saved? Jesus looks at them and says, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. If we have to let go of good things, if we're telling people that have hitched themselves to good things, they, they're not supposed to bring those good things with them, or at least not supposed to put them in front of Christ, who, who really will be saved? Verse 27, Peter answers again, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? We, we've let go of it all. I left the nets. I left the boat. I left my father. I left. What's, what's there for those of us who do let go? Jesus answers in verse 29. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Jesus says is, let go of the good thing that you've grasped too tightly, and when you do, you'll get it back a hundred times fold, and you'll get the thing the guy was seeking the whole time anyway. You'll get eternal life on top of that. We've had the formula backwards where we say, hold all the good things and then try to add Jesus in with them. Jesus says no throughout scripture. God says no. The formula is let go of everything in pursuit of Jesus. And when you do that, the blessings will come. They'll come a hundredfold versus what you let go of, and you'll get eternal life on top of that. And let's be clear, the things you ask people to let go of are hard. The story with the rich young ruler, it was his wealth that made him sad. But let's look again at what verse 29 says. Everyone who has left houses, maybe some of us have done that, or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children, for my sake. Jesus doesn't leave it at wealth. It's any of the good things getting in the way. I don't know about you, but sometimes I read a list like that and I think, man, I'd rather just ask, have Jesus ask me to get rid of my stuff. Jesus says, have to let go of the people as well. That they could become the idol, that they could become the hindrance, that they could become the, the relationship I've placed too much priority on and it's left me unfit for service in his kingdom. That's what Jesus says. Maybe it begs the question for us, what would we be too sad to leave behind? Our jobs, our money, our friendships, our safety, our luxury, our country, our family, our... What is it? What is it that we hold so tightly to? We've either placed it alongside or in front of Jesus and said, we'll, we'll do whatever we need to. We'll follow all the things God says as, as long as we get to keep this. And we've grasped it tightly enough that while we don't use the word, it's essentially become an idol to us. Throughout scripture, God challenges people in these kinds of ways. There's scriptures like this with the rich young ruler where it's a call to sell the things we've grasped too tightly. There's scriptures in the Old Testament where it's a, it's a call to only uh, gather enough food for one day and never try to secure enough even for the following day, but to trust and rely on God to provide throughout each of those times. And we see the hardest ones where he sells somebody like Abraham, and I need you to let go of the promised son Isaac and show me you're willing to sacrifice even him, that you're not placing him alongside of or in front of me. God continues to challenge his people in these things. 
And here's where I'll ask for grace as I say it. Where there's a vision that we would be people who don't do it. The truth of the matter is that myself, many of us individually, and certainly collectively, one of the stumbling blocks we have as a church is that we've held on to too many good things. I don't, mean what, I don't mean that to say there's things we have to stop doing, that old things are somehow bad and new things are somehow good. I'm just saying too often when we're called to pursue Jesus, we say we want to do that, but only if we get to bring all this stuff with us. Only if the program that's been healthy and helpful for me continues. Only if my family's treated in the way I want. Only if my preferences are heard. Only if my desires are met. Only if my style matters. Only if, only if, only if, and we continue to grasp good things. I'm not arguing, and Jesus isn't arguing that any of them are bad things. But we've held them so tightly, we've placed them alongside of or often in front of Jesus. And he's saying at times, the call to follow Jesus has to take precedence, even and maybe especially when it means leaving some good things behind. We start to argue those things as necessities. But God, I have to have. But God, how could I survive without with? But God, it's always been. Jesus addresses that as well. This time, not a story, but in his teaching in Matthew chapter 6 as part of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Stop being afraid of losing the thing. God is good. And when you pursue him, he puts good things into your life. God wants to bless. God wants to express his love towards you. When you let go of the good things, it's because you're trusting in a really good God. He goes on to say, because the birds eat and the flowers, they look more splendid than Solomon ever could. Why are we worried about these things? Even, not even just things like moving or shelter. He's like, why are you even worried about food? Why are you worried about clothes? You don't need to be worried about anything. Instead, he sums it up this way in verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We don't get them because we hold to them firmly. We get them because we trust in and follow and have intimacy with a good God who wants to bless his children. So the formula isn't hold as tightly as we can to the firm things we love and hope that God comes alongside and blesses those. No, the formula is seek God first. Hitch everything to him. Let go of everything that could possibly be in the way, even when it's good things, and hitch it firmly to who Jesus is. And then as we seek him and his kingdom and his righteousness, all those other good things come back. And what he said later was they come back even a hundredfold. But if we hold them and we hitch ourselves to that, we'll constantly be asking the question, what else do I have to do? Why don't I have the intimacy I want? What do I still lack? What am I missing? That's the positive way of saying The harsh reality of the way of saying it is Jesus may be looking and saying, and you're unfit for service in the kingdom of God. Not because of your sin, not because of your behavior, not because of your lack of understanding, but because you've held too firmly to good things and you've placed them alongside or in front of Jesus. If I was summing up my heart, I'd say it this way. My heart for us as a church and for us individually is for us to get better and quicker at saying yes to Jesus. And I think the biggest barrier for us in doing that individually and collectively is the hardship that comes with leaving good things behind. And yet I think as Jesus has done throughout scripture and throughout history, he calls us to do just that. To let go of all of it, to die to ourselves, to hitch ourselves first and foremost to him and his kingdom, to be the bride he longs for us to be. And that as we do that, out of the goodness and love and grace that he has, he will bless us in all of those ways beyond what we ever could have imagined. 
And so my hopeful application is this, that we would be people who repent of and rebuke our selfishness, our pride, our legalism, our religious spirit, the idolatry, idolatry we can have of our families or our systems or our programs or our luxuries or our comforts or our preferences. And instead of those things, we'd be willing to die to ourselves and fully become the bride Jesus longs for us to be. I want to pray for that. I want to pray that our hearts are going to be softened, that our idolatry will be broken, that our self-centeredness is going to be refocused, that our worry will be vanquished, and that our intimacy as Jesus' bride would be fully restored. Would you pray for that with me? God, I am thankful that you were willing to leave good things behind. That Jesus was willing to leave the perfect love of the Father and the Spirit, perfect communion with them and the perfection of heaven to come here, to leave that behind and to come here to live with us, to model life for us, ultimately to die at our hands so that the kingdom could be better, a hundredfold better. Those good things were left behind so that better things could happen. And I pray that we'd be willing to follow in those footsteps of Jesus first, of the model of the disciples as well, and that we would leave behind even and especially good things so that we could fully pursue Jesus, so that we could be your bride well, so that we could have all the intimacy with you that's promised and that we desire, so that we would lack nothing because we'd be hitched fully to you. And I pray then that your word would be true and that as we do that, we would then experience a hundredfold the kinds of things we had let go of, that we would see your blessing flow to us. And then as we receive it, we would extend it out to others as well, showing them of who you are and the good news of Christ so that they could then have right relationship with you also. I pray that we would be people who are willing to leave good things behind as we hitch ourselves fully to you, that we would seek your kingdom first and let all else be added after that. We know it's reliant on your spirit, and so we pray the power of your spirit in us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As you go today, I hope you go fully hitched to the kingdom of God. I hope you go able, if possible, to celebrate the fathers in your world. I hope you go with grace and peace. If you've got time, feel free to stay and connect with some people before you leave. Ask them about their Father's Day plans or just about how life is going. It's a great time for us to interact. Have a good day as you go. You are dismissed.